This video is sponsored by Squarespace. More about them later. I did a hardcore Nuzlocke of Pokemon X using only Fire-type Pokemon. Unlike most Pokemon games, the Kalos region is teeming with little pyromaniacs, and that's a relief, because in a Nuzlocke, if a Pokemon faints, it's dead forever. And since I can only catch one Pokemon per route, Every single encounter matters. One unplanned death and my chances of success could go up in flames. So let's get started. My very first encounter is the Fire-type starter, Fennekin. At this point, Billy Joel here is still an innocent, but time turns flames to embers and he won't stay that way for long. By the end of this playthrough, Billy will become a hardened killing machine. On Route 1, I catch a Fletchling named Alicia Keys. She's not a fire type yet, so she goes to the box. But the Panseer from Santaloon Forest named Johnny Cash is a fire type and immediately joins the team, as does Katy Perry, the feisty little Litleo. Which means that if we include Alicia Keys, then we've literally doubled the number of fire type encounters from Diamond and Pearl before we even have a single gym badge. Take that, Sinnoh. Speaking of gym badges though, the first one is a walk in the park. Viola's two bug types get completely trounced by Sweet Katie. Just like that, the first gym badge is ours, and we're off to Lumio City. If Vertigo had a hometown, it'd be somewhere here in this unnavigable 3D hellscape of a city. I can't believe I'm saying this, but the French deserved better. Fortunately, our stay in Lumios is short. I make a beeline to the Pokemon Lab, where I'm introduced to Augustine Sycamore, and goddamn this man should be an eligible encounter himself, because it's getting hot in here. Sadly, I have to just settle for a Charmander named Ed Sheeran. Seximore also gives me a Charizardite X, but since I usually ban Mega Evolutions in my Nuzlocks, Ed will be stuck dealing with DIS, just like his Cantonian counterparts. On our way to Silent City, my entire team manages to evolve, including Alicia, who's now an active member of our five-man roster. Man, in this case, collectively meaning fox, monkey, lion, lizard, and bird, just like it did in the Declaration of Independence. I also catch a Houndor named P! Unk from Route 10, so suddenly we have a full team of six Pokémon. Which is good because the second gym leader is Grant. And if you can't tell from that extremely on-the-nose name, Grant uses rock types, quite literally putting my fire types between a rock and a hard place. I have a plan, but it'll require one of our beloved team members to metaphorically jump on a grenade. In practice, though, it'll be more like getting crushed by a boulder. And that burden falls on Jonathan Poop Monkey Cash. Grant leads with Amara, who graciously has a quad weakness to fighting type attacks. Even so, a lucky crit with Rock Smash was absolutely needed to get the one shot there. That's obviously a phenomenal start, as it leaves Grant with his second and final Pokemon Tyrant. But now, it's time to say farewell to old Johnny Boy as we hit Tyrant with a yawn, and a Rock Tomb brings him down into the yellow. I'm tempted to switch out to another Pokemon here, but I don't want to risk the crit, and the speed drop from Rock Tomb would mean that I'd be risking Tyrant getting an early wake up. So, with a heavy heart, Rock Smash hits Tyrant for a bit of damage, lowering his defense in the process. And then, a Rock Tomb has Johnny go down, down, down. But his Valiant Sacrifice means that I can safely bring in P! Unk to deal with the now sleeping Tyrant. This ends up being a misplay because Rock Smash does way less damage than I was expecting. Even at minus one defense, it isn't a two shot. Bite, which has more base power thanks to Stab, looks like it would have been, and since Tyrant ends up getting an early wake up, he's able to fire off another Rock Tomb that would have easily killed my newest team member with a crit. Fortunately, I'm unpunished as we're still faster and able to finish off Grant's Carnivorous Dino on the following turn. The correct play there was always to bring in Ed Sheeran, who knows Dragon Rage, which would have been a guaranteed two-shot. Nevertheless, badge number two is ours, and the journey continues. But our victory did not come without sacrifice, and now our team is down to just five members. In the Tower of Mastery, our quintet prepares to face off against my rival Serena for the first of five times throughout this playthrough. She has the Water-type Frogadier, which once again is a pretty big issue for my Fire-types, especially because Frogadier, and even more so later when he evolves into Grin Ninja, is quite speedy. But I have a solid plan. I lead with P! Unk against her lead Meowstic. With her Dark Typing, she's immune to Meowstic Psychic-type attacks, meaning that she can pretty safely set up a sunny day. After taking out the little kitty with a few bites, Frogadier gets baited in next, and with the sun up, the power of water pulse is halved. 
So, P exclamation mark unks safe to chomp away at Serena's amphibious ace. We have a person berry in case water pulse confuses, but Frogadier switches to quick attack for his last few turns alive. Absol is last, but goes down to a few Dragon Rages from Ed Sheeran, who's holding an Eviolite. That nets us a clean victory over Serena, and brings me to the fight against Corina for badge number 3. But her fighting types are no match for Billy Joel. A Psybeam gets the one shot on Mianfu, and then a critical hit Psybeam gets the one shot on Macho. That crit probably mattered, and is definitely a little lucky since Machoke knew Rock Tomb, but an Eviolite meant that we were always safe there. Halucha is last and outspeeds Billy, so she gets off a power up punch to raise her attack. This is a little scary since she also tanks a Psybeam, but on the next turn I switch to Alicia Keys, who tanks a Flying Press, which activates Flame Body. It also procs Alicia's held Rocky Helmet, so between that chip and the damage from Burn, Alucha falls at the end of the turn, concluding a shockingly easy third gym badge. Luck like that is bound to run out eventually, though we certainly don't need it for the next gym leader Ramos. Before that, we do have to fight Serena again, but other than being three levels higher across the board, her team is literally exactly the same, which means that I can do exactly the same thing and get exactly the same outcome. This fight might honestly be the most superfluous rival fight in the entire franchise. I genuinely do not understand why it's here, especially when there are three other rivals in the game that we almost never never fight. As I mentioned 10 seconds ago, the fourth gym leader is this sweet little old man Ramos. So we take a flamethrower to his grass types and burn them all to a crisp. Or in the case of his go-go, we aerial ace him to a crisp. Can we just take a second to acknowledge how weird the background in this battle is? The proportions are completely off. Look at how big that chair is. Also, why would the grass type gym leader litter? For a game that generally has pretty good art design, this one's kind of rough. But anyways, unsurprisingly, it's a super easy victory for the fourth gym badge, so let's move on. This means it's off to Route 13, aka the Lumios Badlands, which without exaggeration may very well be the worst thing to ever come out of a video game. Navigating through this barren wasteland is first world torture. It is horrendous. The camera angle makes it impossible to see what you're doing. The wind makes using your roller skates virtually impossible, which are needed to fully explore the route. And the overworld Pokemon that gun you down faster than a police <laughs> and the overworld Pokemon that pop up every three seconds makes getting to your destination take roughly 8,000 times longer than it should. The Lumios Badlands are the work of the devil. They're a magnum opus of a sh design choices. Whoever was responsible for letting this abomination go out to the public should feel very bad. May they be cursed with slightly more traffic than they expected for the rest of their life. And speaking of magnum opuses of sh it's here in Route 13 where I catch my first new team member since before the second gym. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the team, Sia the Slugma. As we head into the 5th gym battle against Clement, Sia is our only not fully evolved Pokemon. The rest of my team is looking pretty strong, though Ed and Alicia aren't too great for this particular battle against Clement's electric types. And without an electric type resistance, this fight is actually quite scary. Especially because both Billy and P exclamation mark unk have minus special defense natures. The former is my lead into Clement's flying rat. We hit him with a mystical fire that just barely misses out on the KO, as Emolja retaliates with an aerial ace for a fairly respectable amount of damage. Clement goes for a hyper potion, so another mystical fire leaves Emolja with a slightly larger tick of HP than before. And then, I do something very dumb. As Clement heals for a second time, I go for flame charge, thinking that the speed boost might be helpful for Clement's zippy heliolisk waiting in the back. However, because Flame Charge makes contact, it activates Emolja's static ability. This is potentially catastrophic, because even though we can kill Clement's lead on the next turn, Magneton comes in next and now very obviously outspeeds. A Thunderbolt does nasty damage, but fortunately doesn't crit, and we also don't get fully paralyzed, so a Mystical Fire does bring Magneton down to their sturdy. On the next turn, I switch out to Katy Perry as Magneton sets up an electric terrain. So we can take them out on the following turn with an echoed voice, but now I have to deal with a speedy and deceptively strong Heliolisk that's able to fire off electric terrain boosted thunderbolts. I go for a second, now 80 base power echoed voice, thinking that it would do enough damage for a 120 base power echoed voice to get the KO on the following turn, but as you can see, something in my calculation was very off. 
Not that it matters, because Heliolisk's Thunderbolt gets a paralysis. So now I'm in a tough spot. Katie and Billy are paralyzed and ready to be sniped off by a Thunderbolt. Alicia and Ed both easily go down to a Thunderbolt as well. P exclamation mark Unk will be able to tank one Thunderbolt, but because Houndoom has a fully physical level up moveset until level 50, I can't get the one shot on Heliolisk before he'd finish me off. That leaves Sia the Slugma to mop up my mistake. Even with Eviolite, she's not surviving an electric terrain boosted Thunderbolt, but by using her gooey body as a utilitarian lightning rod, we can get a safe switch into P exclamation mark Unk. So, R.I.P. Sia. Our time together was much like a corgi. Short, but beautiful. You were the best meat shield a guy could ask for, and you'll be remembered not by how you died, but by how you lived. With poise, grace, and elegance. P exclamation mark Unk replaces her dearly departed teammate and does big damage to Heliolisk with a fire fang. Fortunately, a thunderbolt from Heliolisk doesn't crit or get another paralysis, so as the electric terrain fades, P exclamation mark Unk takes the kill with a bite, winning us a sloppy fifth gym badge. That means that we're back down to five Pokemon as we meet up with our rivals on Route 14. When I do Kalos playthroughs, the fight against Serena here almost always ends up being one of the harder fights of the entire run, for reasons that I don't fully understand. Fortunately, as seen in the previous fights against Serena, I have a pretty solid strategy. After dealing some damage into Meowstic with Bite, we can set up a sunny day, taking virtually no damage from a disarming voice. Then a second Bite kills Meowstic, which should bring in Greninja next. Except it doesn't. Absol comes in next. This is presumably because Greninja's water type move is Water Shuriken, a move that hits 2 to 5 times with a base power of 15. Since the AI reads the base power of multi hit moves as the base power of just a single hit, Absol's 70 base power slash ends up being read as more effective than Greninja's super effective 30 base power Water Shuriken. So, for the second major battle in a row, I made an oopsie. Absol isn't really a problem for P exclamation mark unk though. A swords dance into a quick attack is pretty annoying, but especially with leftovers recovery, it's not all that much damage. The main issue is that nibbling on this dumb dog has burned through all but one turn of my sunny day. So as Greninja comes in next, we find ourselves in a pretty tough spot, especially since this bozo is faster than all of my Pokemon. A quick attack does a tick of damage as I go for Fire Fang, hoping to induce a burn. But as the sun fades, I'm kind of in trouble. With a few low rolls of water shuriken, we could still make it out of this in one piece, though that's not what fate has in store for us. On the next turn, I watch in horror as Greninja outspeeds and hits P exclamation mark unk once, twice, thrice, and force, cleanly getting the KO. Well, that sucks, but the good news is that Billy Joel can come in and finish off Serena's murderous amphibian with a grass knot though a double crit from Greninja's first and thankfully only two hits of Water Shuriken damn near give me a heart attack. But with that, the battle is won and we can move on. I really wasn't expecting to head into the fight against the sixth gym leader Valerie with only four Pokemon. Fortunately, her fairy types have an atrocious matchup into Billy Joel, who's still mourning the loss of his canid teammate. Valerie's lead Mawile goes down to a single flamethrower. Her Sylveon goes down to two Psy Shocks, and then her Mr. Mime goes down to two more flamethrowers. We barely take a smidge of damage, and the battle is over before it's even started. So now I can finally make my way into the Lost Hotel and get an encounter that will single-handedly save the rest of the run. A Rotom who becomes a fire type in their microwave form. Metallica gives me access to stab Thunderbolt, which is life-saving against the various water types that I'm about to face in the endgame. A minus speed nature is a tad unideal here, since Metallica is still weak to water type moves, but nevertheless this is a phenomenal addition to the team. And it's right on time because another Serena fight is up next. Metallica is my lead for their debut battle. Without an immunity to psychic type attacks, they aren't quite as solid of a lead into Meowstic, but with leftovers they get the job done just fine. Two Thunderbolts kill the cat, which should bring in Absol just like before- Oh, come on! Well, it turns out I'm an idiot. Greninja now knows Dark Pulse, which has 80 base power and is therefore higher than Absol's 70 base power Night Slash. 
The fact that there's so many of these rival fights so close to each other, and that they're all so similar, makes it really easy to overlook the slight differences, and rushing through them is obviously causing me to make a lot of very avoidable mistakes. Fortunately, Metallica is bulky enough to survive three hits from a water shuriken, so Greninja just falls to a thunderbolt, and I'm unpunished for my third mistake in fairly short succession. Serena's Absol is dispatched by Ed Sheeran, and her Flareon, the newest addition to her team, is one-shot by a nasty acrobatics from Alicia Keys. So that's the last Serena battle for at least a little while. Next up is the seventh gym battle against Olympia and her psychic types. A dark type Pokemon would be pretty nice here, but Metallica will have to do. A Thunderbolt into Olympia's lead Sigilyph is enough for a quick one-shot. Slowking is second, but she too falls to a second Thunderbolt. Meowstic is third and last, so it's off to Alicia Keys on a fake out. Then we nail her with a hard acrobatics as Olympia gets greedy and goes for a calm mind she'll never be able to cash in. Meowstic falls on the next turn, and the seventh gym badge is ours. Even if she couldn't cash in on her Calm Mind setup, Olympia can still cash in on this sweet deal brought to you by the sponsor of this video, Squarespace. Squarespace is an online platform that helps you build and manage your own website, whether that's an online store for your business or a personal blog for your thoughts. Using their all-in-one platform, it's quick and painless to easily design professional and polished websites. For example, with the help of their customizable templates, I created poppyhg.com, the one and only destination to find curated pictures of my corgi puppy, Poppy. I'm just gonna say, what we're all thinking. The design of this website is fire. Squarespace also has a ton of other really useful features, like analytic information about the traffic of your website, the ability to add and play embedded videos directly on your website, and Squarespace member areas, which can be used to connect with audiences and create exclusive members-only content. So if you're looking to start a website for your business or hobby, then you should absolutely check out squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch your website, you can use my custom link to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Thanks so much to Squarespace for sponsoring this video. Now, let's get back to the challenge. Before Serena has time to challenge us to yet another battle, we get a casual notification about the imminent end of the world. So now it's time to put an end to Team Flare's nonsense, which requires three more or less consecutive fights with Lysander. The first two are simple enough, especially with his Gyarados's quad weakness to Metallica's Thunderbolt. But the third one is a little tricky since Gyarados will now Mega Evolve. Not only does this remove his quad weakness to electricity, it also gives him the ability Mold Breaker, which ignores Metallica's Levitate ability, making them very susceptible to earthquakes and rendering a potential sunny day setup effectively useless. So instead of zigging, we're gonna zag. Lysander leads with his Mian Shao, and I lead with Alicia Keys, who knocks out the Weasel thingy into next week with a super effective acrobatics. Pyroar is next, so we let another acrobatics rip, which does fantastic damage, but leaves him with a sliver. A hyper voice comes out in retaliation, but it isn't enough to threaten a KO. Thank goodness for 1.5 times crits, huh? Another acrobatics takes out Pyroar, which brings in Honchkrow as the final Pokemon before Lysander's scary Mega Gyarados. I switch to Katy Perry on a Night Slash that does solid damage, but nothing to worry about. Then we outspeed and with a wide lens, connect with a Will-O-Wisp to pacify the Italian chicken. This gives me a safe switch into Metallica on the following turn, as Honchkrow continues plugging away with Night Slash. From here, I set up a Rain Dance, which might seem counterintuitive given my Fire-type team, but with the Rain set up, Metallica is safe to fire off perfectly accurate Thunders, one of which obviously nukes Honchkrow right out of the sky on the following turn. So, as Gyarados comes in last, we're in a perfect spot. Lysander Mega evolves into the Cat from Cinderella, but with 110 base power, a single Thunder is just enough to seal the deal and net us a clean victory over the first of only two Mega Pokemon in the entire game. With the world saved, we can turn our attention back to the Gym Challenge. On the way to Snowbell City, I can catch a Torkoal from Route 18 named Adele. This brings our team back to a full 6 for the first time since Clement, but this is my last chance. Adele is the final encounter, since all of the other potential fire types share a route with one of my other encounters. It's these 6 that we'll need to get to the Hall of Fame. No substitutions, no do-overs. The next major challenge is the Rival Bridge on Route 19. The three back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back battles provide one of the game's only potential major challenges, especially since there's no healing between the first two fights. But unfortunately for my rivals, my team has a pretty good matchup into their Pokémon. 
Shauna is first and her Del Caddy is quickly dispatched by Katie, the superior kitty. Gudra then gets pummeled by a critical hit acrobatics from Alicia Keys, who gets the free switch in on an earthquake. And since Shauna's starter is the grass fighting type chestnut, he too gets bested by a single acrobatics. Tierno, the dance major or whatever, is next, but all three of his Pokemon are taken out by Metallica. His Talonflame goes down to a Thunderbolt, his Crawdonk goes down to a Thunderbolt, and his Roserade goes down to an Overheat. Easy peasy. Trevor is third and the only one of these three wieners that is remotely challenging. His Aerodactyl has the potential to be pretty intimidating, but fortunately his only Rock-type attack is Ancient Power, which comes off of his abysmal special attack stat. First though is Raichu. I can't afford the special attack drops on Metallica from using Overheat, and since I neglected to teach him a better move, I'm stuck whittling away with Thunderbolts. Raichu can't do much in return though, so by the time he goes down, Metallica is basically at full HP. Aerodactyl comes in next and does the most frustrating thing an AI opponent can do. He hits a 55% accurate supersonic, which causes me to hit myself in confusion. Ladies and gentlemen, we've got a ball game. Because if Ancient Power gives Aerodactyl an Omni Boost, we're in a boatload of trouble. But it doesn't. Metallica hits through confusion and Thunderbolt kills Aerodactyl. Short ball game, I guess. Florgis is Trevor's last Pokemon, so Alicia comes in and kills her with a single Acrobatics, winning us the battle. Acrobatics is just a ridiculously strong move. And with Alicia's naughty nature and attack IV of 31, our tiny bird hits like a freaking truck. That'll continue to be useful as we make our way to the Elite Four, but before doing so, we need to make a quick pit stop in Snowbell City, click Flamethrower three times into Wolfric's Ice Types, and get the eighth Gym Badge. So just like that, we've made it to Victory Road. There's a final fight with Serena here, but it's virtually identical to the previous fight, plus or minus an Altaria, and it goes off without a hitch. The more pressing issue is one of the three unavoidable trainers at the very end of Victory Road. Specifically, veteran Timio, who has an incredibly obnoxious Gigalith that knows both Earthquake and Stone Edge. With his ability Sturdy that prevents me from knocking him out in one hit, this is the perfect counter to all six of my fire types. Without a Focus Sash, I don't have a guaranteed way to prevent one of my Pokemon from dying to a crit. Hell, most of my Pokemon will die even without a crit. My best bet is to burn Gigalith with Will-O-Wisp, but as Aaron Cybertron Zhang's life purpose is to remind us, Will-O-Wisp has pretty lousy accuracy. Since X and Y came out after the fiasco at 2013 Worlds, Will-O-Wisp does have 85% accuracy instead of 75. And with a wide lens, we can bump that up to 93.5% accuracy, but that's still a 6.5% chance to miss. In other words, it's more likely than a critical hit, which happen a lot. Veteran Timio leads with a Trevenant, so the only one of my Pokemon that can outspeed and KO the undead plant and deal with Gigalith is Billy Joel. So he's the one that'll be tempting fate. A flamethrower prunes Trevenant and out comes Gigalith. It all comes down to this. Will-O-Wisp thankfully connects, saving Billy from a truly monstrous Stone Edge follow-up. With Gigalith Sturdy broken from burn damage, a Grass Knot now takes him out on the following turn, winning us the battle and getting my team of fire types to the doors of the Pokemon League. After some preparation, here's our final team, all leveled up to the level cap of 65 to match the aces of each member of the Elite Four. Do my six arsonists have what it takes to finish this run strong? Or will I be digging a few more graves before the sun sets in Kalos? It's time to find out. Let's do this. First up is Drasna the Dragon Trainer. She leads with Dragalge, and I lead with Billy Joel, who gets a clean kill on the part poison type Drake with a Psy Shock. That brings in Altaria second. Another Psy Shock does good damage thanks to Altaria's mediocre defense stat, but then Billy falls asleep from a sing. I do my best to wake up as Altaria starts firing off fairly soft dragon pulses, but Billy falls to about 50% before waking up and taking out the fluffiest of the dragon types with a second Psy Shock. So third is Noivern. I switch into Metallica, who gets nailed by a surprisingly strong Dragon Pulse. Leftover's recovery means we can comfortably tank another one, but since we don't outspeed, all we can do is fire off a single Thunderbolt before needing to switch out. Ed Sheeran comes in on another nasty Dragon Pulse, which crits. This means that a second crit will kill, but I decide to risk it. Noivern goes for Dragon Pulse, and Ed survives with 28 HP, letting him get the KO in return with a Dragon Claw. Phew. Last is Drudagon, who should be easily walled by Adele. I think this is her debut, huh? 
It's a pretty underwhelming debut, though, because Drudagon switches her out with a Dragon Tail. Adele's Rocky Helmet does some meaningful chip damage to Drudagon, but rather frustratingly, it's Ed who comes back in. So I immediately switch back to Adele as Drudagon misses a second Dragon Tail. On the next turn, we miss a Will-O-Wisp, because of course, and another Dragon Tail brings Ed back out again. Well, third time's the charm, Adele comes back in, Rocky Helmet does some chip to Drudagon, and Ed comes in again! What the hell is this? I switch to Adele for a fourth time, Dragon Tail connects yet again, but the cycle is finally broken as Metallica gets brought in instead of Ed. Though that's still not really ideal. So I switch to Alicia Keys, who gets promptly hit by another Dragon Tail. But this one brings in Billy, who can now finally kill Drudagon with a Psychic and win us a pretty silly battle. The rest of these fights won't be so silly though. Next up is Seabold, whose water types pose a fairly obvious threat to my fire types. Fortunately, Metallica can outspeed and one-shot the Klawitzer, Gyarados, and Barbaracle. That means that Starmie's the only issue, but they're a pretty big issue on account of their power and speed. I do have a plan though, and it starts with killing Klawitzer and then Gyarados with a Thunderbolt apiece. Barbaracle comes in third, but we're holding a Charty Berry so that Metallica can safely set up a sunny day, which will make our matchup into Starmie much better. Now, Barbaracle ends up just missing his Stone Edge, which means that Metallica is at full HP as the ugly Barnacle goes down to a Thunderbolt. This means that it's completely safe to stay in and kill Starmie with a Thunderbolt, or rather two Thunderbolts since they set up Light Screen. Had Barbaracle actually connected with Stone Miss, we would have needed to switch out against Starmie and hoped for some favorable roles, but this ends up being much easier. That's Seabold defeated. Third is the Elite Four's own Fire-type master, Malva. She leads with Pyroar, and I lead with Billy Joel. A Psychic does nasty damage and also lowers Pyroar's special defense. Billy gets hit by a hard critical hit Hyper Voice in return, but the special defense drop is well worth trading for a crit because it means I can switch to Metallica as Malva uses a full restore. And then on the following turn, a Thunderbolt gets a clean one-shot. That brings in Torkoal next, but a Thunderbolt knocks her into the yellow as she just sets up a curse. The AI is obsessed with using setup moves that will never pay off. Another Thunderbolt takes out the Torkoal and brings in Chandelure third. This thing packs a punch, so I gotta be a little careful, especially because she also likes to use Confide and Confuse Ray. Katy Perry comes in and manages to hit her with a Noble Roar before getting confused. Then Alicia comes in on a Flamethrower, which was Chandelure's only way to hit Katy. An Acrobatics puts Chandelure in the yellow before she fires off a Shadow Ball that would have totally killed with a crit. But no crit means that Alicia lives and kills Chandelure with another two Acrobatics after Malva heals. So last is Malva's own Talonflame. Twins, but I know a losing mirror match when I see one. I switch to Metallica on a Brave Bird, which tickles my little microwave oven for roughly 30 damage. A second Brave Bird tickles for another sliver of damage, and then we zap the chicken right out of the sky, winning us the battle against a third member of the Elite Four. Which means that last is Wickstrom, the Steel-type trainer. And despite fire types being a good matchup into steel types, I was actually pretty worried about Wickstrom's sturdy Probo Pass that knows Earth Power and Power Gem. That is, until I realized that Billy Joel is just bulky enough to tank even a critical hit from either of those two attacks. So all we need to do is click Flamethrower four times. Once for Klefki, twice for Probo Pass, once for Caesar, and even just once for Aegislash. That's all she wrote. With that, the Elite Four is defeated. Which means it's time for a channel tradition that dates back to my very first Nuzlocke of Pokemon X and Y almost two years ago. Please take your seats for the latest entry into the Flygon HG Cinematic Puppet Universe. The showdown against Diantha to win the run in one attempt begins right now. Diantha leads with Hawlucha, and I lead with Billy Joel. In classic AI fashion, Diantha gets greedy with a sword stance before immediately falling to a psychic. This brings in Tyrantrum, a truly terrifying monster of a Pokemon that threatens a clean one-shot on every single one of my Pokemon with nasty, super effective head smashes. But inside that scary, featherless exterior is a walnut-sized brain so smooth that it could be the spokeswoman in a Neutrogena commercial. And the six brain cells working overtime to remind Tyrantrum to breathe don't have nearly enough special defense to prevent Himbosaurus Rex from cleanly getting one-shot by a single psychic. So third is Gorgeist, who gets torched by a flamethrower for another clean one-shot. That means that fourth is Gudra, and here's where the one-shots end. Billy Joel sets up the sun with a sunny day, causing Gudra's muddy water to do just a sliver of damage. 
On the next turn, a Psy Shock brings Gudra into the red, as a Dragon Pulse brings Billy to below 50%. Diantha heals with a full restore, so a second Psy Shock brings her back into the red. That causes Diantha to heal again, as another Psy Shock brings Gudra back into the red. That one seems to get the message across, since Diantha opts to not heal for a third time, letting us put the friend-shaped pseudo out of her misery with one last Psy Shock. So fifth is Aurorus. I switch to Metallica as Diantha sets up a pesky light screen. Then we start trading off attacks. Thunderbolt from Metallica and Blizzard from Aurorus. It goes back and forth for a few turns with Metallica dodging a handful of Blizzards such that even though Diantha heals with yet another full restore, we're able to win the matchup and stay well over 50% HP. And that's a good thing too, because Diantha's final Pokemon is Gardevoir and we don't have a super easy way to take her out. She Mega Evolves as I stay in with Metallica. An Overheat hits Gardevoir hard for just over 50%. But then, a massive Psychic comes out, and I fear it's the end of Sweet Metallica. But they hold on with 13 HP. Metallica lives to see another day. However, with Gardevoir in her Mega form, Metallica no longer outspeeds, and even if they did, the special attack drops from Overheat mean that we wouldn't get the kill here. So I switch back into Billy Joel, who comes in on a resisted Psychic. And then, with one final flamethrower, Billy sets Gardevoir fully ablaze, winning us not just the battle against Diantha, but the entire run. And so ends another Kalos playthrough. It's always fun to play these games, even if some of the challenges leave a little bit to be desired. I wish more trainers had Mega Evolutions in the main storyline of these games. I really think that that would have made them much more challenging and memorable. Normally when I do Kalos playthroughs, I match my team size for the gym leaders and the Elite Four members, which definitely would have made a handful of fights much harder, but honestly, I completely forgot about that rule until I got to the Elite Four, and by then I figured that it was too late. Regardless, thank you all so much for watching. The puppet shows are always a lot of fun to do, and I love seeing how much people like them. If you enjoyed watching, it'd be great if you could like the video and subscribe to the channel. Or don't, I don't know. But I do know that you should follow me on Twitter and Twitch to keep up with streams of my future ROM hack challenges. You should also subscribe to my highlights channel to get highlights of the challenge I'm currently streaming before it's cut down to a video on the main channel. And you should consider subscribing to my Patreon or becoming a channel member on YouTube, which are the best ways to directly support the channel. The links to everything are in the description below. Stay tuned for more Nuzlocke videos, and until then, remember to always, always, always play around the critical hit.